was dealing with a, a quite daunting attack by Iran, they were still able to get some trucks into Gaza. Um, so in these early days after the previous phone call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, where the President talked about the need to increase humanitarian assistance, we have seen Israel take steps to, to, uh, to do exactly that. Now, as we've also said, it's still not enough. The, the need is dire. And what we're going to be doing is watching for sustained commitment to doing that over time. But, but thus far, there has been an increase in humanitarian assistance. Just on the, on the timing of, the war, of any type of warning. So are you saying Oman never told a U.S. partner, um, Switzerland, Oman, any of them, Turkey, Iraq, never gave them any information about the attack they were preparing to launch and that that information never reached the U.S.? The United States had no messages from Iran or from anybody else, as I said in my opening statement, that, uh, that, the, uh, that offered a specific time frame or a specific set of targets uh, or the types of uh, weapons that they were going to fire. So just concretely, um, why would U.S. partners in Turkey, Jordan, Iraq lie about passing along the Iranian messages about any forthcoming attack? I'm not, I'm not calling anybody a liar here. I'm telling you, from our perspective, what we knew and what we didn't know. And we were able uh, to help with Israel's defenses because we had information that we had received and Israel had received uh, through our own uh, uh, our, our, our own efforts, but it never came as some sort of message from Iran with, I mean, the, the, the timing and the target. I, I, it's, it's, it kind of boggles my mind that anybody would believe that Iran would pick up the phone and tell the United States who, who they know, who, who they know is been very, very directly involved with helping Israel defend itself and very public about doing that and detail the times and the targets. Look, this to me seems like a lot of, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking kind of stuff, woulda, coulda, shoulda, and, and maybe they want to make it appear like, you know, this was some sort of uh, small pinprick of an attack that they never meant to succeed. You can't throw that much metal in the air, which they did. Uh, uh, in the time frame in which they did it, and convince anybody realistic that you weren't trying to cause casualties and you weren't calling, trying to cause damage. They absolutely were. Just one more. Um, is the meeting with Israeli, Israeli officials on Rafa still, is that happening this week? Uh, I don't have a date for you. We're still trying to get uh, that nailed down. As I said earlier, we'd like to continue those conversations. Thank you, Karin. Uh, hi, Admiral. House Majority Leader <clears throat> Scalise said on Friday that uh, Speaker Johnson was negotiating uh, with the White House modifications to the uh, Ukraine aid package. Are you, what is being negotiated? And uh, you just categorically said that the White House opposes standalone Israel uh, bill. That's right. Supplemental. Are you also opposed to changes uh, to the supplemental, for example, changing oh, yeah. aid uh, uh, to a loan? I know it would make your jobs a lot easier if I negotiated this thing up here in public, <laughs> no, just, but I'm not going to do that. You're right, the President did have a, an opportunity to speak with Speaker Johnson and other congressional leaders, including, uh, including uh, uh, McConnell and Jeffries, and he made it clear that the best and the fastest way to stand by our allies and partners is for the House of Representatives to take up the bipartisan bill that the Senate passed. But are you also opposed to the modifications and changes as you oppose the standalone? I've answered the question. Thank you so much, Sean. First of all, thank you for your dedication this weekend and keeping us all informed. I think we all saw more of you than our own families, which was real cool. Um, you certainly got... saw more of me than my family did. <laughs> Uh, I got two questions. First of all, um, administration officials told us on Sunday that they had help from India, China, and Iraq. Can you just detail, um, you know, some, give us some of the details on that? And does that represent a move forward in U.S.-China relations that you were able to cooperate on in thwarting this? Yeah, event? as I said earlier, I think I'll let uh, other countries speak to the, their participation and cooperation and the degree that, the, that they're comfortable doing that. Um, I can only speak for the United States and what we did. Represent a step forward for the US I think it, what I, I think what it says is, uh, without getting into the specific contributions of other countries, as I said in my opening statement, it shows that Israel's not standing alone. That I mean that 
unlike Iran, which is increasingly isolated on the world stage, Israel has friends. Israel has uh, uh, great skill, great professionalism, great military capability, and that's not by accident. All of that comes from the support that they get, particularly from the United States, but other countries as well. And then, if the U.S. can and, and allies can help shoot down Iranian drones over Israel, why can't they do the same over Ukraine? Yeah, I knew this question was coming too. Look, different conflicts, different conflicts, different airspace, different threat picture, um, and uh, the president has been clear since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. The United States is not going to be involved in that uh, that conflict uh, in a combat role, and uh, we haven't. We have been providing Ukraine the tools that they need to help defend their airspace, um, and unfortunately, we can't do that right now because we don't have that national security supplemental funding that uh, that they so desperately need. Uh, the Syrian Christians are the indigenous people of Iraq. Um, and before liberation, they had about two and a half million, and they're down to nearly 200,000. And just last month, the uh, Iraqi Supreme Court uh, removed all of their, uh, we had five seats in the Kurdish parliament for many decades, and those were renewed, were removed. Have you, has that come up in any of the discussions? I'll, I'll take the question. Thank you, Thank you Corinne. And thank you, John, for all you did over the weekend. I have two questions. First, you mentioned the shipping of aid to Gaza from Israel. Do we have a U.S. consular official at the border who is confirming that the aid actually gets there? I'm not aware of a consular presence at the border, but uh, we're in, as I said, constant touch with our Israeli uh, counterparts. You know, we also have David Satterfield, who is the president's special envoy, for that exact purpose. And uh, I mean, he's uh, he's like Waldo. I mean, he's all over the place, constantly up and down. I mean, making sure that that stuff is getting in and keeping the president and the whole team fully informed. And my other question is that, given the recent developments with Iran, is the U.S. going to step up its contacts with the opposition to the current regime in Tehran? And I mean specifically, exile groups in the United States, plus on the ground the Baluchi, Azeri, the Kurds, and the Sunni who are in opposition to the regime. I don't know of any such efforts uh, in the wake of the, the attacks. All right, a couple more. Way in the back. Um, thank you, John. Why is the U.S. not going to participate in a counteroffensive? Again, I think I've answered this question. Uh, the President had a good chat with the Prime Minister. We talked about the uh, incredible success that, uh, that we and they achieved on Saturday night and, and the message that that success sends not only to the region but also to Iran as well. And as I've also said, as the President has uh, certainly uh, said, we're not looking for a war with Iran. We're not looking to broaden and deepen this conflict in the region. How exactly is he trying to de-escalate this situation? Everything the President's been doing since the 7th of October has been designed uh, to try to de-escalate and to try to keep the conflict from widening and deepening. And that includes the moves that he made in the last 10, 12 days to add resources to the region so that we could help Israel better defend itself. And my goodness, it all paid off. I mean, instead of having 100 ballistic missiles land inside of Israel and cause untold damage to infrastructure and to human lives, none of that occurred. And the reason none of it occurred was because the president was ahead of the problem set. Right. Thanks, uh, John. Just a couple of follow-ups. Uh, the coalition that put together limiting uh, Iran's development of nuclear weapons is that still solid in face of what's going on? As the president has said, we'd love nothing better than to be able to uh, solve uh, Iranian uh, nuclear progress, nuclear weapons progress, through diplomacy. Unfortunately, that's not an option right now because the the Iranians, well before any of this, just weren't negotiating in good faith. None of the diplomatic efforts were, were, were paying off. And so that effort kind of fell moribund uh, as we look for other ways to increase pressure on Iran. The President has also said that while he would prefer to deal with this threat diplomatically, he also will make sure that he's got options and choices available to him to ensure that Iran never achieves a nuclear weapons capability. But the countries that were backing that coalition still a member? They're all China, Russia. I mean, you're, you're talking about a process that's just moribund right now, Brian. Okay. I mean, it. it the, and so the, the other follow up the container ship. Was there, there have been rumors. Is there any, the container ship that was seized by 
or on? Was there anything of a sensitive nature on it? Do we know what was on it? I think uh, I'd refer you to the Pentagon on that. I don't have an update on the cargo. I, finally, I, well, I want to thank you for using the word sh schwack and, and, and of course, uh, where's Waldo? I'm going to hear about that <laughs> one from my wife. But, 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 the, but at the end, you understand the reason why the question about advanced knowledge, because the president did come back early, and I think you I didn't to say, I, I never said we didn't have an advanced sense of I, what the, I, what I said was, we didn't get that sense from the Iranians sending us a telegram. Right. But, but as Peter asked, I believe, there was, we were told not specifics, but that something was going to occur. No. I, 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 it's not about being told. I think you all understand. We have lots of tools and vehicles through intelligence and other information uh, methods to glean, in, to glean a picture uh, of what an adversary may or may not do. Now, sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's not 100% right. We had a good sense of what Iran was planning to do, and we achieved that level of situation awareness on our own and working with our Israeli counterparts. The notion, the idea that Iran sent us an email or picked up the phone and told us what they were planning to do is just ludicrous. It didn't happen. I don't know how else to be more clear about it. Uh, thank you, uh, John, and happy tax day. Uh, two for you here. Uh, <laughs> Reporting, uh, there's been reporting that. <laughs> She's right. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so there's been reporting that uh, the president uh, suggested to the prime minister that Israel uh, take the win and, and not uh, go further with an offensive response. I've seen I have, that report, I have yeah. colleagues who are reporting that uh, Israel is very much uh, in the process of planning uh, an offensive uh, response uh, to to these uh, this weekend's attacks, given the political situation in in Israel, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, coalition, some of which uh, is a bit uh, extreme, and his own situation. Does the president have faith that the prime minister will not escalate this situation uh, out of his own political interests as opposed to? genuine Israeli security interests, and then I have an unrelated one. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get into Prime Minister Netanyahu's psychology or his political calculations or what going into his decision-making process. What I would tell you is that the President and the Prime Minister speak frequently, certainly as appropriate, and the President has been consistent publicly and privately that he doesn't want to see uh, the war between Israel and Hamas escalate any more than it, than it already has, and he doesn't want to see a broader regional conflict, and he's certainly not looking for a war with Iran, and I am confident that the Prime Minister is aware of the President's concerns. Okay. And on, on Gaza, this morning uh, you said that uh, Israel has been doing the things the President asked them to do, uh, but we really need to see it sustained over time. And you want to know how long is that time? No, sir. Okay. Uh, that would, that would, uh, that would imply that uh, you didn't want to call it an ultimatum, but the, uh, the conditions that the president laid out in his prior phone call with the prime minister that, uh, about the uh, aid workers, the conditions on the ground for humanitarian workers and uh, <coughs> aid getting into Gaza, that that needed to change, or there could be changes in U.S. policy towards Gaza. Can you just uh, lay out here? whether the president is considering that, uh, you know, that set of circumstances and Israel's defense uh, against uh, future attacks from uh, nation states such as Iran to be, to be separate things that, that, that when you see we need to see it sustained over time, that, that uh, the possibility of policy changes is still a reality separate and apart from the president's, uh, as he calls it, ironclad commitment to Israeli security. I've said many times that both things are and can be true. You can be a staunch defender of Israel's defense, and we are, and I think he proved that to a fairly well Saturday night, and still be able to have some tough, candid conversations with the way in which they are fighting Hamas inside Gaza. And those conversations are, are continuing, and as I said, hopefully we'll get uh, uh, to be able to, to sit down again with our Israeli counterparts about their, whatever their thinking are. 
uh, whatever the thinking is about uh, about Rafa. So both things are true. Both things can be true, and 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 those are the discussions that we're having. You can you can be a good friend of of Israel. In fact, I would argue that only a good friend can do what we did Saturday night and still be willing to have tough conversations with the Israeli government about the prosecution of the of the operations they're conducting inside Gaza. So they're being considered separate matters. I, I think I've answered the question. Thank you Thank for you your so patience. Thank you. Appreciate no worries. Thanks, 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 sure. Hi. Um, oh, I don't know. Song. I feel like you guys got all the news of the day. <laughs> Happy tax day. I did take care of my taxes. I don't. I don't have a wife to take care of my taxes. <laughs> Uh, just on the other sort of big news of the day, um, is, the, is the president going to be paying any sort of attention, or will be briefed on um, on the criminal proceedings of former President Trump in New York? Oh, well, as you know, the president is pretty busy today. He has two bilats, uh, as you know, with the, as you just saw with the Iraqi Prime Minister and one with the Czech Republic. So it's a busy day, focusing on. Uh, obviously, uh, our national security priorities and continuing these strong alliances that we have uh, with these two leaders, obviously two separate meetings, and continuing to, um, you know, continue to deliver for the American people. I, I'm sure he'll, he'll, you know, get an update at some point today, but his focus right now are the meetings that he have, he has, and what he continues to do every day. Right. Um, and setting aside the fact that the former president is the, is the current president's general election candidate or challenger for this year. Um, what, is the, what is President Biden and the White House's reaction to this moment in time? I mean, it is a historic <coughs> occasion. Occasion is a bizarre word to say. But it, you have a former president going on criminal trial for the first time in history. So what is the White House's reaction to that? I, I do want to be super mindful, even me commenting on that. And it is an ongoing uh, case. I just want to be super, super mindful and not comment on an ongoing case, even if it's asking an opinion about the, the, you know, the historic nature of what's happening and what's going to occur in the next couple of weeks. So do want to be mindful. And he happens to be, as you just said, a, a candidate, a presidential candidate for 2024. So going to be mindful. The president's going to continue to focus on uh, on the week ahead. He's going to be traveling, as you all know, to Pennsylvania. He has two uh, important bilats today. And it's always about the American people for this president, and that's going to be his focus. Again, Mary. You just mentioned the president's heading to Pennsylvania again this week. He's making multiple visits to the yeah. state. Can you just give us a, a sense of, of what we can expect in the coming so days? So it's a three it's coming day or coming? Days. Okay, days. I don't know if you said weeks. I'm like, wow, weeks. Um, <laughs> Uh, coming days, it's a three-day swing to Pennsylvania. He starts it off tomorrow. He's going to start his trip in his hometown of Scranton, uh, where he'll deliver remarks uh, at, at a campaign event. So that's obviously a campaign uh, event, so they will provide more details. On Wednesday, uh, he's going to travel to Pittsburgh, where he'll deliver remarks again on other pieces of the economic agenda. So you can, fo you can imagine a very strong focus on the economy this week. And so we'll have more on that from us tomorrow on what Wednesday is going to look like. And then on Thursday, which is uh, he, obviously he'll continue his swing, uh, he'll travel to Philadelphia for more campaign events. And certainly the campaign uh, will provide any details on that particular day. So it's Tuesday uh, and Thursday are the campaign priorities, obviously, and, and they'll speak to that. And then there's an economic focus on Wednesday. And so we'll have more to share uh, tomorrow on that. Okay. Thanks, Corrine. Um, so first of all, with the Iraqi leader here, um, lawmakers in that country are set to vote on a bill that includes a death penalty or a life in prison for same-sex relations. Um, would passing uh, such a bill harm U.S. ties? I mean, look, uh, you saw the Iraqi prime minister and the president have a uh, bilat today, and I think it shows the importance of that alliance and the continued diplomacy uh, engagement that we've done, that the president continues to do uh, just across the globe, obviously. Uh, the president has been very, very, um, I think, very vocal about uh, any type of uh, well, p supporting the LGBTQ uh, plus community and has spoken out about any type of humanitarian 
uh, or human rights, I should say, uh, any, you know, any human rights violations that we see uh, from here. And they, we always have those honest conversations uh, with, uh, uh, with, with leaders. And the president always has, again, those uh, honest conversations. I'm not going to get into, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of what's happening currently uh, in Iraq. But we've been, pretty, we've been pretty clear about making sure that human rights, uh, human rights, any human rights violations, or if we see anything uh, that is, um, you know, that, that we think needs, we need to speak to, we do. But the I'm just going to be. Raise that issue today. Uh, look, the president always raises human rights issues. If it warrants uh, with, a, a, with a leader, I'm going to be really mindful. We'll have a readout, uh, obviously, of these two bylaws. I'm, I can't say for sure that that's going to come up, but the president has never backed down uh, from having these types of frank, honest uh, conversation and where he stands. And we know where he stands uh, with that community, with the LGBTQ plus community. And then one other topic, uh, Tesla is laying off more than 10 percent of its global workforce. Uh, falling sales and intensing price war for uh, EVs. Um, does the ongoing turmoil in the EV market and the very slow consumer transition away from internal combustion engine vehicles uh, make you doubt your uh, full growing commitment to this space? So look, uh, and I think I've talked about this before. Um, you, look, um, uh, when it comes to EV, we've seen, e we've seen EV sales obviously rise, record highs. Uh, and EVs are more affordable than ever, and I think that's important. Last year, EV sales surpassed one million uh, for the first time ever, a 50% increase. And under this president, EV sales have more than quadrupled. Sales of hybrids and EVs are now a record high of 18% of all light-duty vehicle sales. Average price of EV is down 20% uh, a year ago. And so, look, the president has always talked about one of his priorities as it relates to the economy is lowering costs, and we see that uh, with with these EV sales, obviously, and also creating uh, manufacturing jobs in order, if you're seeing EV sales go up, right, you're going to see a continuation of manufacturing jobs that are needed. And so that is important. We can we believe it's going to create jobs. Uh, I can't speak to Tesla's decision. They are a private, uh, obviously, private company. But we believe what we're trying to do, what we've been trying, trying to do in the last couple of, of years, whether it's manufacturing Manufacturing, whether it's dealing with the climate crisis by uh, making sure EVs are, are available and creating uh, EVs, more EVs, and lowering those costs is working. And so that's what's going to be the president's priority. Uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson has said that he'll move forward uh, with a vote on additional <coughs> Israel aid. If Congress were to pass additional aid for Israel and only that, will President Biden reject it? So we've been very clear, my colleagues from here just moments ago that we uh, will not accept a standalone. Uh, a standalone uh, would would actually not help Israel and, and Ukraine. It would actually delay the needs that they the the, the needs that the, the needed aid uh, that they obviously need uh, to fight. Uh, you see what was happening in Ukraine. Obviously, uh, brave people of Ukraine are, are, are fighting against a tyrant. We need to make sure that they have this, the assistance that they need. We saw what happened in Israel just over uh, over the weekend, and the leadership that this president has shown. It would it would actually it would actually not help them if we do a standalone and we do not support a standalone. What we want to see is that bipartisan national security supplemental that passed overwhelmingly in 7029 in the Senate. And we believe if the if the speaker were to put that on the floor, it would pass overwhelmingly. And so that's what we want to see. Uh, the president made clear to the in that conversation that he had just yesterday with leader leader Schumer, leader Jeffries and the speaker. He was very clear about that. We need the speaker needs to move forward on the bipartisan on the national security supplemental, which we believe would get a bipartisan, uh, overwhelming bipartisan support. That's what we want. That's what we have to see. A standalone, we do not support. Did the president think that that conversation moved the needle at all? I mean, this supplemental has been at a standstill in Congress. So in that conversation with House Speaker Mike Johnson, did he receive any sort of <coughs> commitment that these two would move together? I mean, look, you saw, you heard from Leader, Leader Schumer, you heard from Leader Jeffries. They called on the speaker to move forward. Uh, we saw what happened over the weekend. We see what happens every day in Ukraine, every day. And if they want to move quick, quickly, if they want to do this in an easy way, if the speaker uh, wants to do this the easiest way pass possible, the fastest way possible, there is, a, there is a national security supplemental that is waiting, that is ready to be put on the floor. We know it would get bipartisan support. We know this. We've heard from Republicans. We know where Democrats stand, and so they have to put this on the put this on. Uh, you know, they got to put this on the floor. The speaker has to move quickly. Has to move quickly. On another topic, the Baltimore Bridge crash uh, 
is now under federal criminal investigation. Has the president been briefed on that, and has he been in touch with anyone uh, in the Maryland delegation? So what I will say is the president is regularly updated on what's happening in Baltimore. Obviously, the port uh, uh, moving forward with that is really important, getting the bridge uh, back up. As you know, the Department of Transportation in the early days announced $60 million to help in that effort. We're going to continue to talk with the Maryland delegation on what they need and how much this is going to, to cost to get that going. Uh, but the president does get regularly updated. There's investigation happening, as you just stated. I'm not going to get in, you know, I'm not going to comment to that. I'm going to let that independent investigation move forward. Okay. Thank you, Corrine. Um, earlier this month, did President Biden tell Xi Jinping to stop supporting Russia's assault on Ukraine? Look, I'm not going to get into uh, diplomatic conversations. We had a readout of that call that he had about 10 days ago with President Xi. It was an important <laughs> call. Uh, it talked. It, it was a continuation of their summit that they had uh, in San Francisco a couple of months ago. Uh, and so I'm just not going to get ahead of or go into details about private conversation. I think the president and we have been very clear. Uh, okay, so the U.S. has um, uh, announced some sanctions and an executive order to address the support that China has given Russia in those months between the summit and now but also said we are prepared to take further steps. So is the administration going to do more to deter Beijing? So look, um, you know, the president is certainly uh, is, um, uh, is, is he's going to underscore, he's going to underscore the concerns, right, that he has uh, to China while also reiterating our readiness to conduct diplom diplomacy with North Korea, right? That's a part of this, too, and our determination to take steps to de deter further pro provocations by the DPRK, uh, obviously, um, and also, uh, you know, so we're always going to be very clear about that. You spoke about the executive action. I'm just going to be super careful about what what was said between the two leaders. Uh, we did a readout, and we've been always very clear, always very clear to speak to speak very directly about our concerns and underscore our concerns to China. But just to be clear, yeah. it came up. Uh, look, I'm just going to be really careful. You have the readout. I'm going to leave the readout speak for itself. Thank you. Gotcha. Is uh, the White House satisfied with the FISA renewal bill that passed the House and is headed to the Senate? Look, I think it's important that it moved out of the House, and now it's going to go to the Senate. And we've talked about that. There was a deadline, as you know, and it needs to. We got to get going with the FISA. It's That's really right. important to get that done. Some of the changes that the White House is okay with, that the reforms. Look, is, we uh, are. We are. Um, I think we're. We're satisfied that it has gone. It is moving. It's going to go to the Senate. We'll see what happens there. Uh, but it is. Uh, we. You've heard from us. You heard from even. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who talked about that the last time he was at the podium, it's 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 important to our national security that we move forward with Pfizer. Now it's in the Senate. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Green. We're going to ask about gas prices. Um, they've been going up over the last month, 20 cents a gallon. Um, is the president considering any new actions, like releasing more oil from the strategic petroleum reserve? So don't have I don't have any new actions to read out. I will say I will note that gas prices remain uh, well below their peak back in 2022. I think that's important. And the uh, the average gas price right now is cheaper than this time uh, last year. And that's because of what this president has been doing over the last three years, including the SPR. Uh, and uh, look, let's not forget jobs are up, wages are up, clean energy manufacturing is up. All of these things are incredibly important because of this president's historic investment that he has made. Uh, and so, but I would, it, I think it's important to note that it remains uh, well below the 2020 peak, 2022 peak, pardon me. It's only three cents uh, lower than a year ago. It's up 52 percent from when President Biden came into office. Any then talk about changes in policy to, to encourage future investment in oil and gas industry? So look, the president's committed to lowering cost. He is. That is something that you see at the center of every economic policy. When you hear him giving remarks, he's talking about lowering costs. He understands how the American people are still being squeezed. And so the reason that it remains below 2022, the gas prices, as you're asking me, uh, is because of the historic investment that this president has made. So of course, we're going to continue to monitor uh, and do everything that we can to answer those questions by the American people. What else can we do to lower cost? But it is important that it is uh, cheaper. It is cheaper to get gas than it was a year ago, and that's because of the of what this president has been doing, because of the historic uh, investment that he's taken. Thanks, Green. Is there a follow-up on that? 
is there any indication that when the president had asked for the richest Americans to pay their fair share, that uh, inflation and the rise in gas prices are linked to that request? Say that one more time. Do you think that it, the, the rise in prices of gas and inflation, which is still rising, is linked to the president's request that the richest Americans pay their fair share? Look, what I, here's what I will say. The way we see the economy is very different than the way Republicans see the economy and how we make sure we have an economy that works for all. Making sure that the, the wealthiest among us, the billionaires and corporations, pay their fair share, we believe is the way to go here, not putting that burden on everyday Americans. That's an economic policy that we believe in, and a policy that uh, builds the economy from the bottom up, middle out, not trickle down. And so we're going to continue to lower cost, and we're going to ask those billionaires and corporations to actually pay their fair share. That's something Americans want to see. That's something Americans want to see. As, as it relates to inflation, we look at a trend here, and we have seen uh, in, inflation moderate over the past several months. And that's important as well to note. But look, we see it very differently. We want to make sure we're protecting Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, lowering costs. Republicans don't want to protect that. And they want to give billionaires and corporations a, a, a tax break. That's not how we see this. Uh, yeah, follow sure. up. Earlier there was a uh, reports that the administration, or at least the Department of Justice, and they haven't commented on it, uh, may have reached accords or are reaching out to Julian Assange for a plea deal. Any update from you guys here as to whether or not there would be a pardon or you would support a plea deal? That's a Department of Justice question. But, but the that, president that, that is a Department of Justice question. I can, I'm not going to get into it. So uh, I'm, I would refer you to Department of Justice. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so this week, a ton of people will be here for the National Cannabis Policy Summit, and there's currently still a patchwork of state marijuana laws to regulate the drug safety, including whether there are traces of lead in products. Since marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, but becoming more common at the state level, is the administration doing anything to try to improve safety regulations of products or any consideration of legalizing marijuana moving forward at the federal level? So uh, I will give you a little bit of an update. Uh, so as you all know, the president asked, uh, asked Secretary of HHS and the Attorney General to initiate the administrative process uh, to review how marijuana is scheduled. Uh, HHS has concluded their independent review guided by the evidence. The scheduling review is now with DOJ and any input should be uh, certainly directed to them at a time and in a manner they say is appropriate. Uh, so this is a matter at this point, once now that HHS has, done, has uh, uh, completed their review, it's in the Department of Justice and they can speak to uh, where, uh, where marijuana rescheduling is at this point. All right, oh, go ahead. Thanks, Good job. Kareem. Uh, I was wondering, looking backwards, the 2020 election cycle, so you're not impacting uh, the upcoming oh, election cycle. Okay. <laughs> looking backwards. Okay, looking see where backwards. this is going. No, you don't actually don't know where it's going. I mean, I was, no, I didn't say that. I said, let's see where this is going. I have no idea where this is going. I have no clue. I'm going to help you. I, I'm, yeah, I know you will. Thanks. I know you will. In, in 2020, do you think that the American electorate was helped by seeing Donald Trump and Joe Biden on the same stage oh. at the same I time. Is, now I know where this is going. <laughs> at a presidential debate. Was that helpful, do you think, in terms of people making that you decision? Know, that, that's a question for the American people. I can't speak to that from here. I, I can't. Yeah. And, and, and 2020 was a, a different time. It was yeah. a different time. And looking ahead uh, to this upcom upcoming election cycle, do you think it would be helpful to see these two <laughs> candidates who are in a rematch? So slick. Uh, <laughs> so slick. Uh, also uh, competing against each other to president. As the debate. president would say, uh, you can't kid a kidder. Um, <laughs> what I will say is that is a question for the campaign. Uh, they will gladly, I'm sure, gladly take, take that question. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience. I know it was a long one.